Okay, so good evening and thank you for being here to to people. It's um, already a success. No, 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 you, you, you won't believe it, but some other days there was no one. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, well, I'm, I'm very happy that you're here. Um, I am afraid that you might find the talk a bit um, superficial since the aim of these talks was just to give a uh, general view, a glimpse into uh, different aspects of the Catalan culture. Um, but in any case, I welcome you for the last time. Thank you very much again for being here. Uh, thanks to the support of our sponsors. Uh, as usual, I start with the acknowledgements. Uh, during November and December, we have been able to organize a series of conferences here in the uh, Estonian Literary Museum devoted to different aspects of the Catalan culture, uh, traditions, celebrations, folklore, linguistic worldviews. And, uh, well, today is sadly the last talk. I will share you so with you some information regarding religion, rather religions, in, in Catalonia. Um, well, I will briefly start uh, by providing uh, some sort of introduction into the current situation regarding uh, religion or the religious landscape of the country. And uh, it will be followed by a historical overview of a more diverse past in terms of, of uh, religion in Catalonia. Uh, and I will finally stop in uh, Christianism uh, as an identity marker for uh, Catalan people. But um, let's start from the beginning. And, well, if you look at it, um, at first glance, Catalonia is a rather average, multi-religious Western society. Uh, there is a relative majority of Catholics, the traditional dominant religion in the country. Um, these are the results of a study conducted by the so-called Board of uh, Religious Affairs that is funded by the Barcelona City Council. And these are the answers to a pretty straightforward question, what is your religion? Um, and, well, as you can see, uh, many people still identify themselves with uh, Catholicism. Um, and, uh, nevertheless, I think um, it must be taken into account that in the last, um, in the last decades, uh, the religious landscape has changed significantly. Um, migration has brought new religions to what was once a rather flat landscape. Um, but unfortunately, we well, do not uh, really have time to, to, to look into this current uh, situation today, although I will mention something related to it a bit, uh, a bit later. Um, if we look at the general trends regarding the study of religion, we can see that indeed this uh, migration of the last years has changed a bit the way in, in which these studies have been conducted up to the end of the 20th century. And I am quoting here now Griera, uh, 2012 work. Um, she provides an overview of the study of religion, of the religious fact in Catalonia. And she indeed uh, observes that until the late 20th century, um, many studies about the religious fact in Catalonia were related to secularization, the process of secularization, also religious socialization, and um, various manifestations of popular religiosity, pilgrimages or uh, Marian apparitions. Seemingly, um, these apparitions are more frequent than you would think of. Um, so they deserved some scholarly attention. Um, this shift uh, brought by, by migration, it's also noticeable in um, more recent studies that are focused on religious minorities. So um, there's a growing trend of studies devoted to sects um, and again, um, 
many much has been written about for example the evangelists which is a growing sect in not only in catalonia but also in in spain and some other uh, countries with a catholic background um, some serious and comprehensive studies such as uh, the one conducted by struck et al in 2005 have been conducted on religious mapping of conurbations, major conurbations in Catalonia, the major conurbation of Catalonia being Barcelona. Um, also religion, the, the, the relationship between religion and immigration, but um, also the institutionalization of certain uh, minority religions. That is to say, uh, for example, the fact that uh, now uh, Islamic communities um, construct their own mosques and, so to speak, they um, form part of the, of the current flow of religious expressions. Um, in fact, talking about religion, immigration, um, particularly from, from Muslim countries, uh, has been a subject of major studies from the point of view of social linguistics. This is uh, a journal, Traballs de Sociolinguistica Catalana. This is the major journal uh, in Catalan language dealing with social linguistics. And they devoted uh, a special issue, uh, issue number 27, 2017, on uh, intergenerational linguistic transmission. It can be seen from the cover, but much was devoted to um, to linguistic intergenerational transmission in migrant families. Uh, so it is, a, um, it is a major concern in terms of social linguistics, um, what language these migrants choose when they arrive to Catalonia. Catalonia being an entirely nowadays bilingual country in which Catalan and Spanish are widely spoken, probably more Spanish in some um, big urban areas. And, well, um, social linguists pay special attention to this uh, intergenerational transmission because there is where the language shift can be detected. Language shift from Catalan towards Spanish, obviously. However, this was just uh, a glimpse into the current situation because um, I guess uh, we're talking about um, religion in Catalonia. Maybe it's a bit more productive to look into history. And well, as we have seen, we are talking nowadays about uh, a multi-religious landscape, um, but mainly predominantly Catholic. If we talk about um, history, well, um, in Catalonia, at least in the Middle Ages, uh, the three, three main religions coexisted more or less peacefully. Of course, I'm talking about Islam, Judaism, Christianism. Um, so, it is widely known that the Iberian Peninsula was conquered by the Arabs in the 8th century. Um, almost immediately, small Christian kingdoms confined in the north started the slow process of territorial claim, and hardly any Muslim population remained in Barcelona, in the Barcelona area. Uh, already by the end of the 12th century. Um, I find this map particularly useful because um, you can see the Ebro River, which is kind of dividing the um, territories of Aragon, Catalonia and Valencia into a northern and a southern part. Um, and as you can see, the process of conquering um, Islamic territories in Valencia was uh, extremely fast. It was a conquering campaign conducted by a king called James I, Jacob I. And as you can see, Peñiscola, which is the northernmost, um, the northernmost dwelling uh, in Valencia, was conquered in um, 1233 by... 45, they had arrived almost to Alacant or Alicante, which is the southernmost city in the current uh, Valencian community. So the situation in Valencia was slightly different than that uh, north to the Ebro River. 
It was a large extension of land. It was conquered uh, comparatively fast. And it still included a large Muslim population. The Christians could not get rid of. This made it impossible to repopulate it completely with people from Catalonia, as uh, it happened in the northern lands. And indeed, until the beginning of the 17th century, the population of Muslim origin living in Valencia represented around 30%. So as you can see here in a, in a study conducted by the, histor the Catalan historian Ardit, um, in the early 16th century, out of uh, 300,000 approximately inhabitants, a third were of Muslim origin, and this proportion um, was kept for the next for the next century. Until 1525, Valencian Muslims were allowed to practice their religion and customs freely. Um, however, during the popular revolts that took place in the Valencian community uh, at the beginning of the 16th century, many of them were forced to be Christened. The validity of these forced conversions were broadly discussed, and it was then when the term Morisco was coined. Uh, as you probably can guess, Morisco uh, derives from the word Mur, Moro is still nowadays used in a very derogative sense in Spanish and in Catalan to refer to people of um, basically North African Maghrebi origin. Um, Morisco in that time referred to um, former Muslims who were forced to be Christian as a consequence of the official decrees issued by the, by the kings and by the authorities. Um, from the start, the conversion of these Moriscos um, was a problem, both for civil and religious authorities, including the infamous Spanish Inquisition. And they finally decided to allow a period of 40 years for the converted Christians to adapt to their new situation. Uh, according to Ardit, uh, this was to no avail because of the great majority of Valencian Moriscos proved faithful to their original uh, religion and customs. And this is how the idea of their expulsion gained ground. And indeed expelled uh, they were, as it is de depicted here. Uh, it was King Philip III who signed a degree in 1609 ordering the eviction of uh, these Moriscos. And, well, this uh, just depicts how they had to uh, embark from several Valencian port towns um, and basically uh, leave the country. Um, what is interesting here, though, is to see how... Oh, I'm sorry for the misspelling. Historiographical framing. Um, I was saying that it is interesting to see how the process of expulsion has been framed. Some historians um, have adopted a rather Morisco file um, approach to it, and uh, it has been said even that their expulsion caused a delay in the process of capitalist development in the area. Um, these Morisco communities being um, very important for the agricultural development of the land. So um, some scholars um, believe that uh, by getting rid of them, they just um, uh, avoided a proper development of the, of the area in capitalist terms. Of course, there is also the Morisco-phobic uh, approach, and uh, many historians also defend that uh, their expulsion uh, was simply based on uh, religious grounds. So, um, it is interesting to notice that in the Catalan language territories, um, despite the fact that the official uh, reconquering from the Arabs in Spain uh, ended uh, at the end of the 15th century, 1492, when uh, Granada was taken, uh, some of these Muslims still uh, lived there until uh, the beginning of the 17th century. 
What about Judaism? Well, um, there is historical evidence that uh, Jews were present already in the what is nowadays the territory of, of Catalonia in the 6th century. Um, they were probably a minority, um, and they were probably rather integrated, or at least they didn't have the, the force to... Um, to be a linguistically independent community because uh, most studies point out the fact that they were Catalan and Arab speaking, depending on the area of the country where they were settled. And um, the 12th and 13th centuries was the golden era, the so-called golden era of Catalan Aragonese Judaism with Jewish civil servants um, having influential positions as courtiers, interpreters, and doctors of medicine in Catalonia. Uh, by the end of the 13th century, the then King Peter the Great, not the Russian Tsar, of course, granted the city of Barcelona uh, certain uh, um, urban privileges called recognoverum proceres, and that forbade Jews of any kind of authority over Christians. Of course, the rights of the Jews then diminished gradually, accom accompanied by some bloody episodes uh, in the next century until uh, they were finally expelled in 1492. What is left of the Jewish culture in the Catalan-speaking territories? Well, not much. Uh, but however, in many cities, uh, the old Jewish quarter is still referred to as Kall, Kall or Jewish quarter. Um, this is a purely Catalan word to denominate the Jewish quarter. There have been some discussions about its origins, but it seems to be settled now that it uh, derives from Latin, callis. Uh, in, indeed, uh, calle in Spanish means street, and probably originally was the street, and therefore the quarter where Jews lived. Um, well, some Catalan cities, such as Girona in northern Catalonia, had a significant Jewish population and a distinctive Jewish quarter. Uh, that uh, it is used nowadays as a tourist attraction. Um, so with the expulsion of these significant religious minorities, Catalonia and other Catalan-speaking territories became fairly homogeneous in terms of religion. Uh, in that sense, it is a situation very similar to that of the rest of Spain. However, um, what makes maybe the case of Catholic um, religion different in Spain is that on several occasions has been used to construct a separate uh, Catalan national identity. Um, there are many examples, but uh, of course I uh, can't expect you to be here forever, so I have chosen two of them. Um, uh, namely, these are the Romanesque mural painting and the Black Madonna. So let's start first with the Romanesque mural painting and then we will deal with the Black Madonna. That maybe it sounds a bit more mysterious. Um, what you have here uh, is a detail of the apse of a small Romanesque church called San Clemente Taul, located in the Pyrenees, which is considered to be a capolavoro by art specialists of European Romanesque painting, dating from the 12th century. Um, the interest in, uh, of Catalan Romanesque painting, according to Pagès, um, started in the late 19th century. It was promoted by the Renascenza generation, a group of intellectuals inspired by the nationalistic ideas of Romanticism. They were determined to regain the former glory of Catalan literature and culture, and saw in these paintings the essence and the origin of Catalonia. Uh, indeed, the Romanesque churches uh, and, and, and the paintings that uh, decorate its walls were created at the same time that the Catalan language was evolving and distancing itself from the corrupted Latin, Latin uh, spoken in the low Roman Empire. Uh, I have talked a little bit uh, in previous talks about the severe blow 
that the Spanish War of Succession meant for the Catalan culture at the beginning of the uh, 18th century. And in the 19th century, indeed, there was a revival movement uh, trying to, to regain uh, the former vitality of the Catalan language and culture. And in that sense, this uh, recovering of the, of the paintings must be included into this, into this process. In any case, the fate of uh, Romanesque art and its direct link to the Catalan national identity was sealed in 1919, when the Barcelona Museum Board embarked upon a major campaign to purchase, remove, and transfer the Romanesque murals from several Pyrenees churches. And they were taken to the Barcelona Museum, where they can still be contemplated. At the symbolic level, it is evident that the message that can be conveyed by the rescue from neglect of a genuine manifestation of popular or uh, religious art. Uh, it must also be taken into consideration that at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, some of these churches were uh, indeed in danger. Uh, some of them were even bought by um, US millionaires and they were taken brick by brick from the mountains to several locations in the US. So it was, it was indeed seen as uh, an operation uh, devoted to rescue the, the, the Catalan culture from, from neglection. Uh, finally, another example of popular devotion that has also implications for Catalan identity or for Catalan nation building. And in this slide here, you can see uh, Montserrat, or the serrated mountain. It is a huge um, outcrop, conglomerate stone. Um, nowadays, it is a bustling pilgrimage place, full of priests, massive car and coach parks, cafeterias, hotels, restaurants, and religious trinket shops. Uh, in Montserrat, you can find long queues of visitors wishing to visit the Black Virgin, or Moreneta. Um, now, legend has it that the statue was carved by St. Luke, brought to Catalonia by St. Peter, and then hidden during the Arab occupation in a cave. In the ninth century, it was discovered by some shepherds, and when priests tried to bear it off the mountain to carry it to the, uh, to the closest uh, town, it grew so heavy that they could not move it. So they built a shrine around it. Um, modern tests, by the way, have shown that the statue comes from the 12th century and that its blackness, that uh, someone hinted that it could be, I don't know, some kind of um, racial declaration uh, or miraculous uh, coloring. Probably this, this darkness might have been caused by some polish used to used to clean the, the statue or just the votive candles that uh, constantly burn near it. Um, in any case, uh, a big abbey was built around the place where the Moroneta was discovered. It has become um, a very important devotion cult place that uh, still holds significance up until now. It has been compared to places like uh, Lourdes in France or Fatima in Portugal. It serves, it serves a, similar, a similar role. However, interestingly, um, the Abbey of Montserrat played a very significant role as a defender of the Catalan language during the Francoist dictatorship. Um, as you probably know, 1939 was the end of the Spanish Civil War, and uh, with it, it brought a um, tremendous um, attack to uh, Catalan culture and Catalan language. In fact, the language was totally forbidden. Um, books couldn't be published. Uh, Catalan spoken in public was severely punished. And um, nevertheless, in the Montserrat Abbey, already in 1947, some documents related to the exaltation of this Black Virgin were already written in Catalan. And most significantly, in 1953, the abbot 
uh, the abbot of Montserrat, uh, who went by the name of Scarré, pushed to be allowed to publish a religious journal in Catalan. Yeah, Catalan, but religious, as you can see, it was called uh, Vida Cristiana. Nevertheless, in a time where uh, the Catalan language and culture were being repressed, it was a major success. Uh, ten years later, Escarré was interviewed by Le Monde, and while talking to the journalist, uh, he denounced publicly the persecution organized by Franco's regime uh, against the Catalan language. The Spanish Catholic Church had been until then totally submissive to the dictatorship. In fact, uh, it collaborated actively uh, backing Franco during the, during the conflict. Uh, and such an act could only be interpreted as a series of uh, rebellion. Uh, a bit later, uh, the um, Abbey of Montserrat created its own publishing house, uh, which exists uh, until today. And in fact, uh, most of the, yeah, many of the most vibrant publications um, in a widely range of topics, music, secular music, not only religious, but also um, literary theory, art, are indeed published by the publishing house originally set in, set in Montserrat. Um, so, to finish with, um, I believe it can be said that Catalonia, Catalan-speaking territories, have a very rich religious uh, history. Of course, uh, for many years, for many centuries, it has been a homogeneously Catholic country, uh, virtually since the early modern era. Uh, its medieval ages were marked well, by a richer landscape in terms of uh, diversity. Uh, including important minorities from major monotheistic religions. And in the 19th and 20th century, we see how the Catholic uh, religion has also been used in the national identity construction, as well as uh, acting as a defender of the Catalan language and culture, which uh, I think that um, for the Catholic Church of Spain, it's, um, well, a rather... Um, significant uh, difference. Uh, Catalonia nowadays, to conclude with, is as many other Western societies uh, receiving a notable migration influx and well it has become already again a very rich and diverse land in terms of religion. So these are my references. Um, thank you very much Aita. Um, this is not today not only the last uh, not only the end of this talk, but the end of a series of four talks that we have been holding for November and December. So uh, it has been a pleasure. Thanks to Sergei for giving me the chance, the opportunity of, of uh, organizing, of giving them. And thank you all for being here today, for coming. Four people, this is a major success. I am, I am very, very happy. So thank you very much. And well, you might have some questions that I'm not sure I will be able to answer. But nevertheless, I'm all yours. Thanks.